Reviewing food fight. Ah. Nothing like ringing in the holidays than by justifying the gym membership in January I'll never use. Ah. A pumpkin hot dog on a pumpkin bun with pumpkin ketchup. <laughs> Though, would it be prudent to possibly dip it in some pumpkin whipped cream? Has such a feat ever been done before? How was that? Oh shit! I'm late for the Stephen King review! Could I get any heavier foreshadowing? I mean, look at this. The four is left right in the shadows. If we do this to all our props, they're gonna fade! We'll just put you in a sketch later. Hello, I'm the Nostalgia Critic Guy. Remember it so you don't have to. Well, it's the month of Halloween, and you all know what that means. It's time to celebrate a great writer by focusing on his worst work. It's Stephen King time! There's no doubt that Stephen King is spectacular when he's good. But for some strange reason, he's even more spectacular when he's bad. At least, when it comes to his film adaptations. For years, I've been mocking his infamous TV miniseries, but the time has come to finally journey to the next level of laughable hell, his motion pictures. And what better way to start off than the film he had 100% control of, Maximum Overdrive! This is the only Stephen King story that Stephen King himself directed. Hell, he glorifies the fact that he directed it. Just look at the trailer. I finally decided if you want something done right, you ought to do it yourself. I just wanted someone to do Stephen King right. That's right. There's no arguing someone interpreted it wrong. No claiming that filmmakers just don't understand King. No saying that Stephen King's work shouldn't be transferred to the cinematic world or that Stephen King himself wouldn't like it. This time around, there's no excuse. This is the only time we'll ever see Stephen King on Stephen King. That is until Tumblr is born. So sit back, my Halloweenies, and let's see Stephen King done right. I'm gonna scare the hell out of you. This is Maximum Overdrive. Of course, it's only fitting that an author starts off this visual medium with a butt-ton of reading. Let's see, Comet, uh, Tail, Eight Days. Does it give me a reason why the Earth's emitting a broccoli fart at the same time? And fittingly again, King starts off his adaptation by doing what most Stephen King adaptations do, saying fuck you to the audience. Wow, he just cuts to the chase, doesn't he? Even King himself gets its customary cameo out of the way. Honey, this machine just called me an asshole. Obviously, it watched under the dome. As the credits roll, we see all sorts of chaos go on as tons of machines come to life and cause gigantic destruction after gigantic destruction. The only thing that could possibly be more awesome than that? The greatest credit ever put on any film anywhere. My god, I have no idea what they have to do with Stephen King, but I am 100% behind that credit! It almost makes up for this one. Though if somewhere in this movie ACDC decides to coach a hockey team, I wouldn't be against it. We then see a gas station where by far the strangest fucking toy truck you've ever seen in your life pulls in. You like that, huh? Well, if the point of your toy company was to scare the apple juice piss out of your clientele, then yeah, I say you got a winner. Though to be fair, it is scarier than anything in the Sam Raimi movies. Well, filling up on his... Nine dollars for 15 gallons of gas? Fuck you, 1987! One of the truck stop attendants, played by Emilio Estevez, talks to his boss, played by Pat Hinger. Now you want me to work for nine hours and only clock in for eight? You know what that star means, don't you? On parole, boy. Either your ass belongs to me or it belongs to the state of North Carolina. Really? A gold star means you're on parole? What do convicted pedophiles get? A Door the Explorer sticker? Thank you, Bubba. <laughs> oh, shit. 
I just realized I missed Stephen King film, so I can act however I want and it'll fly! <laughs> but within the truck stop, a young Deborah Wilson in drag notices the machines are acting up. Ah, the 80s, when wearing a Twinkie in your hat raised no questions whatsoever. Apart from why the fuck do you have a Twinkie in your hat? Sure enough, other machines start acting up too. An electric knife cuts someone, vending machines spill all over the place, and yes, there is even death by soda. Oh. At least I'm leaving behind a hilarious obituary. Shit! A little boy tries to get away from Stephen King's second killer cola machine he's ever written. Seriously, was it so good the first time it had to be repeated? As we see another boy get run over by a steamroller. Now there is a controversial cut here where it's said in the original the boy's head actually explodes, but it was too much for an R rating. In honor of our sick obsession with violence, we should probably question more. Fuck it. I'm gonna show you the one frame that made it into the film. Ooh, I think you can see his eyeball shoot through his brain. Let me have this. We then see a hitchhiker, played by the dollar store version of Molly Ringwald, pull into the truck stop as the radio says everyone should get off the road. Why? Well, judging by this couple, it's because Haley Joe Osmond is inbreeding. That's the only way you can explain why he somehow became two people. Curtis, is he dead? That's Charlie Smith, by the way, the voice of Lisa Simpson. And if you think her character on that show can be annoying, take a listen to some of this. No, you don't! Curtis, let you You know, suddenly the idea of slitting my throat with her spiky hair doesn't sound that bad. I just wanted someone to do Stephen King right. They end up driving towards the truck stop where our heroes are at, who are checking out to see if the trucks themselves have apparently come alive. Be careful! That jack-in-the-box they forgot to crop out might ruin the scare! Ah! <laughs> huh, no, it would have been ruined even without it. Vroom vroom. <laughs> so... Anybody in there? Nope, not now. So the truck has to adjust its rear view mirror in order to see them? Um, I wouldn't mind so much the idea that trucks have eyes and are somehow in the driver's seat area, but do you have to do it on the only truck in the goddamn movie that literally has eyes? Isn't that kind of throwing the truck anatomy off a bit? But the little boy version of Kim Grease rides around the neighborhood realizing that technology has officially come alive and is killing people. Even a toy car somehow apparently killed a dog. You explain that one. So let me tell you right now. <laughs> wow, that ended abruptly. It's almost like Stephen King looked this scene over and said, No, Kay, an ice cream truck and a lawnmower are the villains in this scene, and... Eh, this is stupid. Let me tell you right now, boring girl. But I guess that can't be as silly as Christine and friends starting to run over people at the truck stop. <laughs> machines just out of the blue came to life, but how the hell is something as random as a comet supposed to give a soul to modern day appliances? It's like if I dip that pumpkin hot dog in that pumpkin whipped cream, something evil would happen. Which is suddenly right next to me. Which is probably cold now, so I'll eat it another day. Or maybe I'll eat it later today. After the review? While talking about the cinematic version of Stephen King playing with his Hot Wheels! Hey! Thanks, disembodied hand, to which your origin I know not! What the hell?! You have summoned us, critic. Behold, we are the trope raisers. 
By God, I've heard of you. You come from a world where aggravating pain and Stephen King cliches are one and the same. You learn to love them after the first 20 books, as you will learn to love them, Critic. But I don't want to love his tropes. I want to make fun of them. But you must. Behold Stephen King trope number 127, The Religious Nut. The Lord has not a shepherd I shall not want. And this beautiful American Truthway Bible this can be yours for just nine, nine you five. Ah, oh, jeez, and I bet he runs into all the redneck characters, right? How did you know about trope number 2647? Because that's all his characters. You're either a country bumpkin or a blood-sucking Christian. Well, surely you don't know trope number 36498. The religious nut dies? Yes, that's the one. <laughs> Of course he does. It happens in all his movies. But are you aware of trope number 385? The obvious symbolism of hypocritical faith? Maybe. Yes. Yes. Look, just because people accept a trope over and over and over, that doesn't make it good. If anything, it makes it worse. You may say that now, critic, but just like a Will Ferrell performance, you will learn to love it, hate it, love it, and then forget you ever saw it in the first place. Well, I look forward to that part. Your defenses will lower, critic. And I'll be there when they do. So like I said... So like I said before, the religious nut is run over by the toy truck. Which despite being an over-the-top drawing of a clown, it still somehow gives a more subtle performance than Tim Curry. You're flirt! You're all flirt! Everyone tries to figure out what to do, while I think this guy went into a coma on screen, as the trucks actually start to circle the gas station. Nothing more frightening than delivery trucks playing Ring Around the Pussies. Here we go around the idiot stop, it's loaded with pots whose IQs have dropped. I think you'll need some peppermint schnapps to get through this damn movie. Meanwhile, our newly deads aren't having much luck as they're being chased down by other evil Herbies. <laughs> A drunk Frodo dabbles in vehicular manslaughter. Zool, mother trucker! Zool! Hang on! Yeah, hang on while I veer comfortably to the right. That'll lose him. Huh. I guess that comment made them extra sensitive to blow up over grassy hills. But I know we can call the police from that truck stop up there. Well, it is a truck stop, and we do need to stop trucks. <laughs> You're just jealous because you didn't think of it first! Unfortunately, the sinister six-wheelers aren't letting up, so our heroes go out to help Squint and Squintier get inside. I think I had the missile on cloak so nobody would see it hit the truck! No! I wanna see it! I wanna see it! By God! She's defying her social class! Where'd you get all that stuff? Oh, we got a whole bunch get of stuff up, down here. Just keep circling. Don't let them know it bothers us. So it's revealed that under the truck stop, there's a shit ton of firearms that they never knew about. Good thing those machines weren't somehow affected. I mean, seriously, there's a gun that starts shooting off later, and yet somehow none of these devices are affected by the comet? What sense does that make? Hey, yo. Ah! There's a reason the guns aren't alive. Some machines are affected more slowly. Those with simpler parts and mechanics are- Wait a minute, wait a minute. Is this like justifying the clown and the spider and it with this complicated backstory when really Stephen King just wanted a reason to use a clown and a spider in it? No, the spider in it is really plain and simple to understand. Oh yeah? What is it? There is a void surrounding the universe known as the macroverse. Your first sentence isn't even over and already I can't follow it. No really, it's super easy to follow. I'm surprised they left it out of the movie. Its natural enemy is the turtle. Well, not just any turtle, the turtle that created the universe and others, but that's another really easy story to follow, and so- Ah, oh, Jesus, we'll be right back after this common sense explanation takes place. And the next thing we knew, Master Splinter raised them, and they developed a machine by, uh, of course, Donatello, because he's the smartest one. Everyone knows that. 
From the mountains to the oceans, in the great state of Maine, everything you need is here, unless you skip the ad that'll take you there. For that's what happens when you don't give in to Stephen King tropes. All ads become commercials for May. Oh, for crying out loud, will you stop explaining how his tropes are genius and just let people watch the video? Not until you hear how many great scenes were left out of his movie adaptations. Like how the original ending of Carrie had a meteor shower. That sounds stupid. It was better the way he wrote it. Or how the girl in It had to have sex with all the boys in order for them to survive. That sounds awful and stupid. It was better the way he wrote it. And don't forget the electrically charged condoms to nap pupil. Well, it, it was, was better, better the, the way, way he wrote, wrote it. Look, can't I just enjoy the terrible tropes in this film for now? So you are enjoying it. Just let me watch it! <laughs> so as the sun goes down and the trucks continue to circle the place, there's only one logical thing to do. Pork. I'll tell you one thing. What's that? You sure make love like a hero. What can I say? Being held hostage by an army of six-wheelers just turns me on. Even the rest of the people seem to be pretty relaxed while these trucks do nothing but keep circling the wagon. Are these things even supposed to be scary? Is turning the sky green somehow supposed to make them even more threatening? It's like watching Gozer's less talented sister. Bull Gozer, the Gozerian's drunken sibling, ain't going anywhere until she gets a bottle of wild turkey. Wild turkey, bitches! I need it! My sister's dead! Killed by some 80s comedians! I... I... Oh god, I need some ibuprofen. But one waitress decides she's done taking it up the tailpipe. We made them. We made them. You can! We made you! Oh dear, it's time for our ceremonial Stephen King actor turns into cartoon character again! Look at her! She's moving like a Jerry Lewis animatronic with extra William Shatner parts! Ohio, you cads! We made you! Don't make a circle around you some more. Well, back to our all-important drinking. You know, when you take the homicidal element out of it, they actually kind of treat it like a nice situation. <laughs> Lord, trucks should try to kill them more often. This is one of the most relaxing times they've had in years. Holy shit. That's that Bible salesman I rode in with. But they hear the religious nut outside making noise, and because we all clearly know he has a chance to make it out of this alive, they try to sneak out and go after it. Kids, Big Ben, come on. Wow, the comet must have also messed with how flashlights work because it's a little confused what's supposed to be lit and what isn't. But before they can get to the guy, the little boy comes across him first. Mister? Uh, yeah. He gets up. He gets up. He gets up. Well, gee, I guess you really fooled me, movie. I guess he's not going to get up. No, really, you totally got me. I'm totally convinced that he is not going to get up and do a jump scare whatsoever. Well, I might as well go do some other stuff, seeing how he's clearly not getting up. You really got me there, movie. Really got me. Really thought he was gonna get up there, movie. Really, really, really got me there. <laughs> what a fucking shocker! Pull me. Pull me! I can't. You're too heavy. Get me out of this ditch. Or by Jesus, I'll kill you. <laughs> Do all dying Christians sound like the bad guy from Howard the Duck? By Jesus, I'll kill you! If you can't take the heat, get out of that kitchen! The team does meet up with him and tries to drag him back, but again, big shocker, he doesn't make it all the way. Thus, they use what they should have been using this whole time, a fuck ton of weapons. It's not like they have a whole shit ton of them at their disposal. Oh, but the weight! 
They hide inside again as the kid discovers his father has in fact passed on. Where's my dad? Well, uh, Dunn got scrubbed by one of them big boys out there. Hey, 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 hang on a minute. Hold on a minute. Just a little lesson in manners from the road twitch. Don't make me lightly slap you like I'm swatting a fly on your chin Hold again. On a well, he got over that fast. Fucking bubbles! But some armed equipment finally makes its way to the stop and starts letting loose. Oh no! Not the extraneous characters! They offered so much and how little they offered! Oh dear, somebody spilled jam on me in between shots! Why didn't anybody tell me the jerk never survives a Stephen King story? Ah, yes, she needs to relive her Oscar-winning moment. We made you! Huh, I guess she just took the bazooka for moral support. Didn't seem to work. The gun starts honking Morse code, which apparently none of the other trucks could have honked. But even more amazingly, one of them actually knows how to interpret it. Incredible. They want us to feed them. Feed them? That's right, everybody. All they wanted this entire time was just fuel. Really? There was no other way they could have made that obvious? Wouldn't it have been easier if they just did something like this? In fact, isn't driving around constantly in a circle wasting their goddamn fuel? You're fucking wasting your lifespan trying to get your lifespan! I just wanted someone to do Stephen King right. Oh well. They all succumb to truck home syndrome and decide to fill them all up. Emilio lets the lead truck know by literally whispering into its ear. Alright, you bastard. Tell all your friends the main line's open. <laughs> I'm sorry, I just don't think I can take a scene seriously when he's whispering into what looks like a mask Happy Meal toy. I got the best shit on the East Coast, practically uncut. The fuel gauge, Emilio. First you start with the fuel gauge. This results in literally hundreds of other trucks hearing the news somehow and showing up as well to get fueled up. Yep, it's about as stupidly silly as it sounds. Imagine you're, you're a race of aliens, right? And you're looking for a new place to live. Dude, you filled up trucks, not survived a war. I think you can be a little less dramatic about it. Sent in their room, using our own machines, sweep us right off. Well, that's an interestingly stupid theory, but like the credit said, comet. Which makes much more practical sense-ish, kinda, not really. But I'm sure it's explained in Dark Tower or something. So, only now do they decide to figure out a plan to take these suckers out and leave. Whoa, whoa, cooler, champ. Little peep business to take care of. Something you wouldn't understand. Now, when I say run, you run, okay? Uh, I know we don't have ears, but we've clearly established I can hear you guys. It's the same volume you were speaking to me just a minute ago. Wow, my God, am I this easy to take out? You gotta be kidding me. I've been fucking foiled by user friendliness. They wait until night to make their escape as, for some reason, the trucks let them do it until several hours later when they finally decide to attack the place. Brilliant planning. Wait until your enemy has fled and then let them have it. Look, they're even crushing the newlywed's car that I'm only now realizing never came to life. Again, explained in Dark Tower, I'm sure. Again, Spider-Man! But wait, what's that? Fuck you, Ice Cream! That's for never having the Ninja Turtle bars. I need my gumdrop eyes. They head towards the boats because... Apparently they're not affected by the comet, alien, ghost, whatever. But Yoda from hell is still ready for some action. Think that can stop me? Oh wait, I'm done. Yeah, good job. Oh, 
so it was aliens! Okay! The comet apparently had nothing to do with anything. In fact, it didn't even pass over by the time all this stuff took place. Um... What a twist? Yes. <laughs> King is often known for twists, as it is trope number two. Really? Just two? They don't all have to be big numbers. So, have you succumbed to the Stephen King tropes and all its tropiness? Actually, yeah, I kind of have. Ah, so you know what it means to love repeatable pain. No, actually I love them for a different reason. In my opinion, this is Stephen King's version of a B-movie. A film that's meant to be over-the-top bad. I don't think he wanted to scare us with this. I think he wanted to make us laugh. I mean, let's be honest, no film using ACDC is intending to scare anyone. In a strange way, I think he's not only mocking horror tropes, but his own tropes as well. When he says, I just wanted someone to do Stephen King right, maybe he's referring to the fact that he's never meant to be taken too seriously. There's always a bit of otherworldly insanity that even he can poke fun of and laugh at. So, as a totally crazy, cliched, explosion-filled bloodbath of idiocy, it's a damn fun time. I mean, okay, it's not for everyone, it's pretty mindless and just has a bunch of big explosions, but truth be told, I kinda recommend it. If you're looking for something that's bizarrely silly, over-the-top, and soaked in testosterone-filled cheese, then this is the perfect Stephen King B-movie for you. So, what do you think of that? I think I got bored halfway through your speech. Thanks. Let us instead analyze the overused tropes of Leonardo DiCaprio movies. Ooh, now that sounds like fun. Uh, let's see, trope number one, he's always a smug and or insecure douche. Trope number two, ridiculous accent. Trope number three, screaming in that ridiculous accent. Trope number four. Hey, that's my favorite prop. Dressing up like an older man even though he looks 15. Oh, hold on a second. <clears throat> I'm the nostalgia critic and nostalgia ween has just begun. Okay, trope number five. Martin Scorsese. Trope number six, Martin Scorsese. Trope number seven, trying his best to have you remember a performance by screaming, yelling, and crying all in the same scene. Directed by Martin Scorsese. <laughs> Kinda goes without saying. This is fun. 